Hi, everybody. My name is Chance McGinnis, and I am a member of the Dole Institute Student Advisory Board, the official student group of the Dole Institute. First of all, welcome to the Dole Institute of Politics, and thank you for attending today's program, presented by the Department of Military History at the Command and General Staff College at Fort Leavenworth. The Dole Institute would like to hear from you about today's program. Please let us know your feedback by contacting us on social media or via email at doleinstitute at ku.edu. To view past programs, visit our online video archive at www.doleinstitute.org. A video of today's presentation will be available on our website soon. We would like to encourage each of you to consider becoming friends of the Dole Institute. Our friends help keep our programs free and open and support archive research and our student activities. Please contact us if you're interested. After the presentation, we will have some time for questions from the audience. If you have a question, please raise your hand and a student worker with a microphone will come to you. Please stand if you are able and ask just one brief question. Before we do begin, I'd like to remind you to please turn off your cell phones. And now, please join me in welcoming Dr. Tom Hansen. Well, good afternoon, everybody. And really, this is an incredibly nice crowd. Thank you so much for taking time out of this, one of the first nice days we've had in a while to spend it with us. Uh, I'm Dr. Tom Hanson. I'm the uh, director of a stable of really, really quality military historians, probably the largest single conglomeration of military historians, uh, at least in the Western world. And at least we like to tell ourselves that. And uh, we have enjoyed a, uh, a long partnership with the Dole Institute, for which we are very grateful. And this is the second uh, iteration of this year's program, which looks at the home front and the war fronts, and so we're kind of alternating from month to month on what we look at. Uh, last month we had Dr. Mark Gurgis talk about the British home front during the Napoleonic Wars, and this year, or this month, we have Dr. Mark Hull to talk about the German home front during the Second World War. And I, I have a sneaking suspicion that's why a lot of people are here, because it does seem to be a perennially interesting topic for people. Uh, Mark is a, uh, a retired Army officer, a retired intel specialist, but he's also a lawyer. Don't hold that against him. Uh, and he is also a, a trained historian. He has a PhD from the University of Cork, is that right, in Ireland? And so uh, without further ado, please welcome Dr. Mark Hall. Uh, good afternoon. Can everybody hear me OK? Uh, I should tell you up front, uh, just because kind of a housekeeping thing, that I, I really look forward to the question, well, <clears throat> Uh, I look forward to the question and answer session after I get finished, but I'll, I'll tell you in advance, if that starts going south, meaning that you ask me a question I can't answer, uh, Dr. Hansen's going to pull the fire alarm, so don't, don't get concerned <laughs> about that. Uh, <clears throat> this has been a, kind of an interesting topic for me to think about, talking about. Uh, I've spent the better part, I, I grew up in Germany uh, in large measure, and I, I have spent a lot of time there. But it's difficult, and I'm going to try to hit five or six or seven areas that I think are, are relevant to the topic. But at the same time, it means I'm going to leave out hundreds or maybe thousands of different things that we probably should talk about at some point. And let's go ahead and first start by tackling some of, I think, what are some of the images of wartime Germany. Uh, if you've seen uh, Lanny Riefenstahl's film, uh, Triumph of the Will, which many Hollywood directors apparently have because it's been in everything from Star Wars to Lord of the Rings, this idea of masses of highly disciplined marching soldiers is a pretty scary image. Uh, it's supposed to be scary, and that, that's part of the reason the film was made the way that it was made. Uh, this idea that you, in Germany, at least one of the popular slogans was uh, der Führer hat immer recht, the Führer is always right. So I think the way that we conceptualized Nazi Germany in the war, I, I want to get away from that a little bit because I think the truth is, is much richer and, and, and more informative, I think, than some of the images. But this is what we know. Thousands of, again, very disciplined, very proficient gymnasts 
uh, in this case at one of the party rallies at Nuremberg, or endless lines of marching soldiers, or throngs of in their tens of thousands waiting for Hitler to appear. But let's go ahead and, and talk about some things, too, that I think that people think that really are not right and, and, they really, and sort of as a stage setter. For example, uh, Hitler was elected as Chancellor of Germany. Uh, you didn't vote for Hitler. You voted for the party. Hitler's hit about in the sort of the mid-30s in terms of his percentages for, for the, the, the last free election before he assumed the chancellorship. So I think one of the interesting questions is, is what can a 35% market share do when it's turned loose on a country in a very horrendous way? Uh, most Germans were Nazis. They weren't. Uh, Nazi party membership, about six and a half million out of a population of about 70 million. Nazi party membership is mandatory, again, not so much. There were a lot of Nazis. Difficult question to answer, and it depends on whether or not you mean card-carrying members of the party or people who sympathize with the party's ideas. Either way, I think you're looking at a huge section of the German population, or at least a, a healthy section, that did not support Nazi Germany. And just as a Hollywood thing, Nazis always wore black uniforms. Uh, and I have extra points for anybody that can tell me what film this is from. Oh, come on. Where Eagles Dare. Uh, because the Gestapo guys always wore black uniforms, even in Hogan's Heroes. Uh, no, they didn't after 1939. Uh, this is Germany. This is actually to include some wartime territory uh, larger than today's version of Germany. And to quickly review sort of some of the things that, are, that get us set for the stage of, of the home front during World War II, uh, Hitler is appointed Chancellor of Germany by uh, Paul von Hindenburg, the uh, president of Germany, on the 30th of January, 1933. From almost the moment that he's appointed Chancellor, things have started to change in Germany. Uh, the pace of this is accelerated uh, after the Reichstag fire in early 1933, <clears throat> uh, they arrested a probably guilty Dutch arsonist for the fire, but Hitler quickly used this as a pretext for having the communists it declared illegal. So effectively, you've taken communists, which was the second, third large par largest party in Germany, out of the equation. So it's a very sort of gradual step-by-step -step thing. You're removing people from positions where they can threaten Nazi Germany, and Hitler specifically. Uh, soon thereafter, the Hitler initiates, and this new Reichstag, the German parliament, is going to pass, and President Hindenburg is going to sign what's called the Enabling Act. It is the, essentially the last legal piece that allows Hitler to rule completely by his, his whim between 1933 and 1945. With these sort of accelerated powers that he gives himself, you would have to be an idiot after really mid-1933 to decide that you want to voice opposition to Hitler. Part of the thing with Nazi Germany is an a, a emphasis placed on something called Gleichschaltung, which means really a coordination, getting with the program. It is a, a, a holistic effort to make sure that every aspect of daily and public life is, is moving along the direction that Hitler wishes it to go. Meaning that if you were an attorney in Nazi Germany, or you're a doctor, or you're a teacher, or you're an accountant, or any other position you can almost think of, both in the professions and outside the professions, you have to be a member of a Nazi affiliate organization to continue your, your work. It's not the Nazi party per se, but it is, it's still a Nazi-controlled organization that is going to quickly remove Jews and anybody else that, that they think might be a problem from practicing in public life in Nazi Germany. 
Hitler's aim, he says, is to create what's called a Volksgemeinschaft. It's a people's community. And this is both your internal life as well as your external public life. And there are various slogans and movements and different things that, that go along with this, but the, this is something that is, is quickly imprinted on Germany after 1933, and deviation from the plan is not really something that, that's going to be possible. Uh, in 1934, the Nuremberg Laws are passed. The Nuremberg Laws define racially who is a German citizen and who is not. It's specific, it's, it's the first, one of the first legal things that starts the process of cutting off the Jews from the German community. It's going to end at places like Auschwitz and Treblinka. But it's, there's a weird compulsion almost that even when, when Nazi, the Nazi government is doing things that are abhorrent and criminal. There's a driving need to make sure that all sort of the legal T's are crossed and I's are dotted. So it's, it's a weird two things that almost you, you wouldn't think would, would be associated together. Starting in 1935, uh, German conscription is back. So young German men of, of conscription age are going to be obligated on a sort of a, a, in a draft system to serve two years in the armed forces. The law in Nazi Germany is, is I wish we had longer to talk because it's fascinating. But law in Nazi Germany really has two, two main purposes. One of them is political. In other words, the law, rather than punishing and achieving justice, the law is aimed at sort of making political deviation impossible. So if that wasn't already accomplished by things like the Enabling Act or the Nuremberg Laws, the, the, the courts and the judges themselves are going to be responsible for doing this. And the other thing is to put an emphasis on stopping criminal activity that could be a threat to the regime. Uh, new courts are created on top of the existing regular courts, specials and people's courts, to prosecute these new sort of offenses that Nazi Germany is, is going to promulgate. Sentencing, which had been fairly standard through the Weimar period, of, uh, is going to be something which the judge's sentence is no longer final. That the SS or the Nazi party or even one of the chief judges says that there is no sentence higher or there can be no sentence greater than that that Hitler pronounces. So if you are convicted of a crime and you're sentenced, let's say, to five years or ten years in prison, Hitler can override that personally and give you whatever sentence he desires. And by the way, it's never going to be less than what the judge gives you. Uh, to give you an idea of how things have changed, in 1938, which is just in the first couple of years of some of these judicial reforms, there are 38 people who were executed in Nazi Germany. By 1943, that total has grown to 5,336. And these are all for cases that, uh, frankly, otherwise would not have probably been criminal acts before the Nazis came to power. The worst crime you can commit once the war starts is Wehrkraftsersetzung. It means you're undermining the war effort. And it can be anything that you like. There is no bit of conduct that, that you, can, you can commit that cannot be shoehorned into this offense. And the penalty for Verkraft says that's on is, is death. So when trying to kind of get, get a handle on what people are living with in the 30s and through the 40s through 45, uh, you, you, we need to keep this in mind. It's, it's a cloud. It's around. People know about it. And again, you understand the penalties for stepping out of line. Uh, this is just kind of a quick list of the different sort of detention facilities and prisons that are available to you as an offender under Nazi Germany. So it goes from the low end of a workhouse <coughs> to the upper end of a concentration camp and after 1942, the, the, the idea that there are camps that are designed that are purely extermination camps. Uh, weirdly, especially in movies, you see you know, the, the sort of ominous, leather-coated Gestapo agent. Uh, 
in Nazi Germany at its height, there were about 30,000 Gestapo personnel. Most of them are clerical or administration. But you're depending on that 35% of the people to, to inform on others. So even things that you say that you think are private, even things that you say to a relative or to a child or to a grandparent, if they take a, a dislike to that, all they have to do is get on the phone and report you to the Gestapo office and the Gestapo will show up at, at, at where you live. To tell the story today, I want to, let's make it a little bit personal. Uh, this is the Meyer family. They live in Berlin, uh, mid-1930s. Uh, husband, wife, two children. And as we go through the different parts of the German home front, I'd like you to sort of keep them in mind and try to consider like what sort of things they would have seen, what sort of things they would have read, what sort of things they would have heard, what they would have eaten, when. And we'll come back to them here in a bit. Food in Nazi Germany is, is interesting. Um, you, you go from a period really where food is readily available and that's not an issue. Uh, but then the war comes and the Na Nazi government does what every other government including the United States and Great Britain do which is food gets rationed. Uh, depending on your level of, as a worker, if you are working in a light duty or a mid-level duty or a heavy workload, uh, you're allowed either 2,400, 3,500, or 4,200 calories per day. Weirdly at first, in some cases, people ate better under rationing than they did before. Because this is a you know, fair amount of calories. I mean, an average person today, uh, 20 to 2300 calories probably. But then rationing starts once the war begins in 1939. Uh, in Britain you did a point system and in Germany they didn't do that. Uh, they did a point system for clothing but not for food. So, um, by the way, I forgot to tell you something that's important. Uh, I have some show and tell items for you. I mean, who doesn't like show and tell? So, uh, if you would kind of, I'll pass these around as, as I go. Uh, please don't take them home and eBay them, but you know, just enjoy. Uh, this is uh, the first thing I'm going to pass around: is a series of rationing sheets, uh, soap, meat, and if I could actually read, I can figure out what this other one is. Something else. <coughs> Restaurants were originally, when the government is thinking about restaurants, especially after the war starts, and the war goes on and situations get tighter, one of the ideas that the government has and starts to implement is clothing, closing restaurants entirely, but they decide that's a really bad idea because it makes people unhappy. So restaurants, mo at least most of them will remain open for most of the war. One of the things that the government is also very creative with is, in, is what's called ersatz. It's a substitute for something that you would otherwise be able to get before the war. So, for example, substitute coffee, because Germany is cut off from any sources of coffee beans, uh, are made often from grain. Uh, my plan was this morning, today, actually, I brought a, it's, there's a product you can still buy, it's called Caro. It's a grain coffee, and I was going to let you try it out, except I thought there was hot water and there's not, and I don't think you want to do caro and cold water, but if you do, just come see me afterward and we can, you know, we'll get you set up. Um, and interestingly, at least f to my mind, is one of the things that they come up with as a substitute, because again, dairy products are very heavily rationed, and there's a priority system. Uh, dairy products going to mothers and children, at least in terms of milk. Uh, Germany lacks a lot of raw materials, one of which is oil, but the thing that they have a lot of is coal. And German chemists in the 1920s and early 1930s came up with a, a chemical catalyst for coal, which produces, among other things, synthetic fuel, 
which is you know nice. And the other thing, weirdly, is margarine that you get can get from coal. So the next time you go to the store and you see that Land O'Lakes butter thing, that may go through your mind even subconsciously. So let's. Uh, one of the other things that the, the German government did to sort of encourage rationing and saving is there were a couple of days each week, uh, and then usually on Sundays it was called Eintopf. Uh, it's stew, so Eintopf, like one you know, cauldron worth of stuff. And the idea was that you don't waste, right? You, you make a point of, of having it with whatever it is you have left over, stir, 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 stir. And that's how you, one of the things how you ration food. Uh, Tuesdays and Fridays were designated as meatless. Your weekly allowances for food, as of 1940. Uh, 20 ounces of meat, 12 ounces of fat, 9 ounces of sugar, uh, different amounts for jam. And this is that, that Caro product I mentioned a minute ago. And this is what the rationing sheets look like. Um, Weirdly, the two up here, one of them is, is legitimate and one of them is not. Because when the British government decides to very sort of cleverly see if they can mess with the German economy, uh, British bombers will drop fake German ration sheets over Germany. So worst case, it, it, it's going to mess up the whole food rationing thing. Or, uh, but you know, in, in case maybe you just go up there and they realize it's a fake and you just look kind of stupid when you're presenting your, 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 your fake ration sheet. This is the fake, by the way, on the right-hand side. Music is a big deal and so is the cinema in wartime Germany. From 1933 to 1945, Germany, specifically or mostly the Ufa studio in Berlin, uh, produces a more than a thousand movies, feature length films. They range from very, very good, even still, to some that are just, just horribly awful. And the tone of the films changes depending on what period we're talking about. <clears throat> so in the 1930s, before the war, uh, you get a lot of sort of variety. There's a lot of comedies. There's a lot of romantic comedies. But as the war goes on, the tone of the film starts to perceptibly change. So that by the time you get to 1943 or 1944, we're making films that are trying to adjust to the new reality of just getting hammered by the, by the U.S. Air Force and the idea that the war may not be going in a very good direction. So in 43 and 44, you, you start to see some epic German films. One of the, the, the more famous series was talking about the life of Frederick the Great. And the movies talk about the king is in desperate situation, the war looks lost, times are hard, and people are, are deserting him, but the king believes and the king has faith. And even though it looks hopeless, Frederick the Great wins at the end. And it's a not very subtle message that even though the war looks like it's really taken a bad turn for us, you know, just hang in there a little bit longer and it's, it's going to work out just the same for us. Um, Josef Goebbels is the propaganda chief of Nazi Germany. He is also in charge of what films are made and how they're distributed. Uh, he controls the money to make the films. And some of his people encourage him to do more sort of ideological, patriotic, uh, Nazi-themed message films. And he says, no, we're, that's not what we're going to do. So weirdly, during most of the war, his, his, the, the vast majority of German films made have really almost no political content at all. Some of them certainly do. But his point here is keep people entertained rather than focusing on the war news as it continues to get bad. And so uh, the most popular film Ufa ever made is a 1942 film called uh, De Grosse Liebe, right, The Great Love. And it's a story of a singer and a fighter pilot, and they fall in love, but they just keep missing sort of each other. It's the wrong time or the wrong place. And the star of the film 
is a Swedish actress and singer uh, who makes a big hit in, in wartime Germany named Zara Leander. Um, the most famous song from the film becomes the most famous, most popular song but one in wartime Germany. Davon geht die Welt nicht unter means the world's not going to end. And you know, I think maybe there could be a concert starting now, so maybe we should listen in. Pretty catchy, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. Let's figure out where I was. There we go. Uh, the other famous song from the war is one you may very well know. Um, is came at, actually the German radio, the German Armed Forces radio station in Belgrade, uh, Yugoslavia, started playing, I think, just for lack of, of other uh, records to play, uh, a song by a German, uh, there are a number of German artists that have recorded it, but a song that was very popular in North Africa called Lily Marlene. Um, the Germans loved it. The British loved it, mm -hmm. weirdly. Um, but Goebbels, the propaganda minister, hated it because the lyrics in German are very suggestive of it's a soldier, and he's thinking about this lamp post where he met his, his girlfriend. The lyrics are suggestive of the fact that he's, he's going to get killed. And Goebbels thought that is absolutely the wrong message to be sending to the troops. And he ordered it pulled, and the complaint was so large from German forces serving all over, both in Russia and Africa, that he had to put it back on. So there's a lot of different versions of it. The German version, wartime version, the most popular is by a singer named Lale Andersen. Personal opinion, the, the best version is Marlene Dietrich, uh, who had escaped Nazi Germany in the 1930s, and Goebbels absolutely refused to play her version. So. Okay, I apologize. I'm having having. See, we have kind of an issue here because I'm like the least technologically savvy person you've ever seen in your life, and, I, and I'm having experiencing a slight technical issue. 
Oh, come on. There we go. Okay. Uh, German healthcare system in during wartime Germany is, is typically excellent. Uh, going back to Germany in the 1930s and 1920s, uh, the Germans are pioneers in many respects. Medical care was free. Uh, each district had a medical director who was responsible for every aspect of, of e anything you can think of with, with health care. Priority is on sanitation, emergency medicine, both of those came in handy once the war started. Infant mortality is almost nil in, in Germany, even through the war when things are getting hard to have. And the German Red Cross runs the, the nurses system as well as many of the hospitals. The German economy, one of the things that Hitler did all, uh, very soon after he took power was to get rid of some of the problem, anticipated problem people in organizations. And, and, and along this line, he dissolved the labor unions because they were, in, in many cases, not fans of his. So in its place, what Hitler created was the, the German uh, work front. Uh, it is a state-controlled Organi umbrella organization for workers all throughout Nazi Germany. Uh, by 1939, because Hitler had, had rigged the economy in such a way that it prioritized war goods and military service, there's almost no unemployment to speak of in Nazi Germany. Uh, the long term, had the war not come in 39, Nazi Germany probably would have been bankrupt by 30, 43, 44. Uh, working hours during the war are a lot, 60 to 72 hours, rising to 72 hours. But one of the things that the Germans did that was very popular both with workers and, and families generally was something called Kraft der Freude, means strength through joy. Strength through joy is a program that allows workers uh, minimally expensive trips to exotic destinations. Germany converted two, or built two cruise liners simply to take workers on vacations. You could go to Norway, you could go to Italy, you could tour the Mediterranean, uh, and that part was very popular. Some of the other stuff, not so much. Uh, and one of the issues, too, with Germany is that one, a policy in the 30s had been, eventually, we would like to make Germany independent. Uh, the vocabulary word for that is autarky, which I think this is the first time I've, in my life I've ever had to actually say the word out loud. I, I only learned what it meant a short time ago. Uh, but by the time the war comes in 39, Germany had not reached anywhere near that point. So Germany, as of, as of the war, is still importing food, raw materials, and Germany produces almost zero oil which makes the decision in 1941 to launch an attack on the country that supplies most of your oil kind of interesting, which they do when they attack Russia. <laughs> so shortages start in this, in the rationing, and, and, and begins pretty in very much in earnest starting in 1941. Uh, most people, the average monthly wage is about uh, 30 Reichsmarks. Another interesting thing, and this was part of this Kraft der Freude strength through joy movement, is they came up the idea with the with uh, Ferdinand Porsche and Hitler and others to produce a cheap mass-produced car, the VW Beetle, right? Um, and the idea was that a German worker could save at, at a five five Reichsmark increments. And eventually, in about three years, the German worker would receive one of these new Volkswagen cars. So you had your little, like, a, like a, your green stamp book, and you got your little, little the stamp here with a picture of the VW on it, and you, you posted it in your book, and you saved, and you saved, and you saved, and then the war comes, and would you like to guess how many of these workers actually got their VW cars? Zero. They sued after the war, uh, sued Volkswagen, uh, demanding their, a free car because they had saved during, during Nazi Germany for a Volkswagen, 
And yeah, that, that didn't really go anywhere. Goebbels, the propaganda minister, in an effort both to keep people propagandized as well as entertained, and his, his, his thing was to see if he could do both of these at the same time, was he made available to Germans a, a cheap but well-constructed uh, people's radio. Uh, there came in two different versions. There was a large version for 70 Reichsmarks and a smaller version for, I think, 30, 35. Uh, and there were hundreds of thousands of these produced, so in your home, maybe for the first time in your life, you had a radio. And you could listen to the quality programming that Goebbels was providing on the German radio network to make sure that, you know, you, you, you got the message. Mm -hmm. And the thing was, there comes a point in 1943, because before that, if you tuned into Nazi radio, you would have heard, in some cases, the very few things early on, so 3940 and for part of 1941, about how well the war was going. And you would have heard about the campaign in Poland, you would have heard about beating the speeches from Hitler, you would have heard speeches from Goebbels, you would have heard news broadcasts to let you know where, and you, many families had a home map so you could track where the troops were. And then comes uh, Stalingrad in early 1943. And also in 43, the German forces surrender in Africa. And the shift in tone of the, pro the, the broadcast is interesting. Some people advocated that what Goebbels should do is continue to sort of pump air into this thing and, and can, about the successes that we're having even though we're not really having them. But he determined it would be worse for morale if we started lying and they found out the truth through letters or people from home on leave. So it's better to explain some of the, the difficulties the soldiers are having, which creates kind of a psychic shock because if you've been listening religiously through, through 39, through 42, and everything's going great and we're winning the war and we're, all, we're this close to Moscow and we're gonna take Moscow next year, and then suddenly after Stalingrad, all of the news is bad news and they're really not sure how to spin this. Because how do you, when it's evident, when your cities are getting flattened and your troops, you're losing more and more troops. I mean, at one point on the Eastern Front, the Germans are losing 150,000 casualties per month. Think about that number for a second. 150,000 soldiers per month. Weirdly, the Soviets are losing, you know, eight times that. But for Germans who are used to, to these, these broadcasts of victory, it's, it's their, I think, sense of doom is probably gonna, is pretty palpable. Uh, German air raid precautions start almost immediately after Hitler comes to power in 1933. Uh, youth and even just ordinary citizens start rehearsing air drills and, and they're really quite proficient at it. Uh, the photograph here, this is some very, actually very small children. I think this is probably 34, 35. Uh, posters go up once the war starts in terms of using the, the Hitler youth as, as primaries in some cases of, of air defense. And the system, is, is kind of a marvel of organization in terms of like what Germany is able to do with its anti-aircraft defenses and fighters as well as, a, mostly as, as effective as people can be with air defense, but it, they're simply overwhelmed. Um, when Hamburg is destroyed over a couple of, couple of days really, and there are 40,000 dead people in Hamburg, there's no system in the world that's gonna make that okay. But firefighting is, is a priority, uh, it's, but it's just not possible to keep up with it. Women are encouraged to volunteer and then later are, are, are directed to serve in air defense units. One of the things that, that goes on in Germany, because of the casualties are so high on the Eastern Front especially, um, there are, by the end of the war, some eight million foreign workers in Germany. Uh, 
this is slightly different than slave labor, which of which there are other millions. But these are people that have either been enticed or paid or threatened, and they come into Germany to do agricultural tasks and some other things. Uh, in this case here on the bottom right hand side, it's a it's a Polish, it's an advertisement uh, in Poland telling workers that you know the promised land of, of, of salary and opportunity lays if you volunteer to go work in Germany. Uh, conditions are from absolutely awful in many so many respects to actually okay in other places. But one of the problems that foreign workers have in addition to being abused and in some cases killed in Germany um, is once the war is closing and Soviet troops occupy a good you know, sections of the country, uh, Soviet citizens or people from the East who volunteer to serve in Germany, are not, the Soviets do not look upon them very kindly. Uh, so if you're a Soviet citizen and you are liberated by the Red Army, uh, that's not going to go very well for you. Uh, Left-hand side here is a propaganda photograph from uh, the, the German news agency, which shows very well-fed, well-clothed, contented foreign workers, you know, writing letters home to their families. On the other side is a warning that is put out by the German government, war it, uh, telling women not to get too cozy with foreign workers. One of the things that Hitler is cons is he's concerned about it and he's certain about is that the primary cause of Germany losing the First World War is the collapse of the home front. And the reason the home front collapsed is because the morale was destroyed. He is very careful and his people are very careful to, to not do too much early, even in during, the, during wartime, afraid that the mood of the German population will turn against them. So in addition to having spies in and amongst the people, the SS Security Service essentially does opinion polls of what people are thinking inside Germany about whatever it is the government's doing. And this isn't, like, even, this isn't for purposes of arrest or prosecution. So you have like, like these, these people like wandering into bars and just kind of leaning in and listening, and then they're going to report the kinds of things that people are saying about the government. Um, to increase morale at the same time, therefore, that's why UFA produces 1,094 films during the war, because it's considered essential to keep morale up, even when, it, especially when conditions get hardest. So theaters remain open. The radio programming it does, it's quite varied. Uh, it's entertaining, it's light, it's comedic, as well as interspace as the war goes on with, with different messages to, of propaganda. A very common sight on a German street, and our Meyer family that I talked about at the beginning would have seen this often, is that of children with these red tins. Winter Hilfswerk, it's it, the winter aid donation. So they would stand on the street corner and you would pass and your Hitler Youth person would, would offer you the tin with a slot in it. And the thing you probably didn't want to say was no thank you. Uh, so you made your donation, and then after people started complaining that they were getting like nickel and dimed and hit up every time that they crossed the street, you would get a little token, a little plastic thing or a little metal badge or something, and you could show that, yes, I've already donated to the Venter Hellsberg, now you know, run along now. One of the slogans that comes out too, and this is at least the, the SD, the security service is reporting, when people can see with their own eyes that their cities are collapsing and burning, and they know that their sons and brothers and husbands are getting killed or, or badly wounded, that rationing is in place, that the economy is getting worse and worse and worse, one of the things that people who are desperate hold on to is this idea, Vendasta Fiora Vosta, if only Hitler knew about this, he would do something. And this is especially true of that.
the uh, serious committed Nazis, that the things wouldn't be so bad if Hitler only knew. He wouldn't permit these kind of abuses to take place. And as the war goes on and on and on, and one of the things is cities are getting bombed, Goebbels makes a point, especially in Berlin, to go to bombed areas and talk to the people who are at soup kitchens or getting medical attention. Hitler doesn't go one time. Not ever. Even when the bombing is, is blocks away from, from his Reich Chancellor in Berlin, he never goes to see bombed or injured people. And during the la once the war starts, and especially after Stalingrad, the number of times he addresses the German people on radio is, is almost none at all. But weirdly, there's a resilience that I think almost has nothing to do with, with Nazi Germany. That their cities are getting hit day and night, and in some cases day and night, and morale suffers but a frustration of the American Army Air Forces and the British Royal Air Force is that German morale never really breaks. Um, it's still this community-centric togetherness piece, and, and no matter how many buildings you blow up or how many people you kill, it doesn't seem to have the, 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 the morale effect that the, that the Allies are hoping. And, and that's probably worth a discussion some other day. Uh, women in Germany, uh, traditionally, at least, and Hitler says this, or at least in, in indicates this, Hitler has a very idealized, very special idea of what German women should be. Specifically, German women should concentrate on three things. Kitchen, church, children. That's it. Uh, German e education of German women should be physical education, and so to keep them healthy and, and raising German children, or having German children, but that's about all. So weirdly, Germany, Nazi Germany doesn't declare total war until 1943. The Americans and the British are, are years ahead of the, of the Germans. And the British are very cleverly and using well women in the workforce, women in the armaments industry, women in essential war work, and Germany just simply doesn't do this until it's too late. Um, it, but as things go on, in 11 percent, um, one of the things that Hitler does that, that's kind of curious, because the casualties are high, and, and maybe for some other reasons that have to do with eugenics, uh, the Germans institute was called the Mother's Cross. That's the th decoration on the top right-hand side. There are three different versions, three different grades of it. it for, if you get a bronze Mother Cross, you've had four children. Silver, six children, and if you want to go all the way for, for, for the gold order, it's going to, you're going to have to have eight children. Now, the benefic benefits of having a mother's cross, first of all, is status, I suppose, but more immediately, it allows you to cut in lines at, 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 at stores. Try this at Price Chopper, and let me, let me know how that works for you. Um, the National Socialist German workers, uh, let, me, let me go back to one thing too. As husbands and wives or, or, or engaged couples are separated by the war or they become engaged during the course of the war, it is impossible physically for as many marriages to take place normally as they would. So there's a ceremony in German, uh, Fernschrauung, which means you're, you're getting married at a distance. So a bride would go to her local registry and on a table is a steel helmet. And at the same moment, the husband or the uh, to-be is going to be make, having a similar ceremony at his unit. And these are actually legal marriages. They, they, they experiment with a weird thing like as, as the war gets, goes, goes further and further. The idea that you can actually marry someone who is deceased. The, uh, that doesn't really work to plan, and they, they think there's some, some sham going on that people are trying to get you know, spouse or decedent's benefits. Um, but once they start it, they, they, they eventually they, they don't completely cut it off again. Uh, the National Socialist German w uh, Women's Organization is, is a very, it's an interesting thing. Uh, there's about two million members. Their leadership, uh, these are serious, hardcore Nazi women. 
uh, who, who very looked extremely happy in this photograph on the upper left-hand side here. Kind of what you would expect a seriously doctrinaire Nazi woman to look like. Uh, in 1943, women aged 17 to 45 are ordered to register for work. Uh, for the children, it's mandatory, actually it's mandatory twice. When Hitler comes to power, the Hitler Youth Organization is, is already in existence. In 1933 and 34 and 35, they're working very quickly to try to collapse all the other uh, youth organizations in Germany. So in 1936, uh, 30, 30, I'm sorry, 30, 36, the Catholic Youth Organization gives up and but also by 1936, it is mandatory to join the Hitler Youth. So if you are from ages 10 to 18, you shall be a member of the Hitler Youth, either the, the Hitler Jugend, the boys version, or the BDM, uh, the League of German Girls. No exceptions. Especially, and after 1939, there are actually legal penalties if you fail to register your child in the Hitler Youth. If you're one of the things that Germany also does as the war goes on is they, they essentially copy what England has done and take children from vulnerable areas inside cities and send them to the countryside. Now in England, you know, if you've ever seen even some of the movies, the idea is you put them with families and they live with the families and then when, the, when things get better, you know, they, they come back to the cities. Hitler didn't do it that way. Uh, you, your children go in groups and stay essentially in camps that are highly Nazified. So you have a ceremony every morning of like going out to salute the swastika flag and you have a school curriculum that is entirely almost based around sort of Nazi educational principles. Uh, they're, they're not letting anything slip here. If you are a promising child in Nazi Germany, you can be selected to go to the Adolf Hitler Schule or to what's called an Ordensburg uh, if you're very, very bright and these are people that are supposed to be fast-tracked into politics and into the SS. They make toys in Nazi Germany. Until 1943 when they order, because of the war, toys are stopped. Uh, the collectibles here are, are toys that are miniature German soldiers and they make miniature tanks. Um, there's a problem though sometimes because the, the hard to find figures are the ones of political leaders. Uh, this becomes kind of embarrassing after 1941 and it's no longer possible to buy a Rudolf Hess doll because Rudolf Hess flies to England and gives himself up. So that's, that's yeah, we're not going to be having that figure anymore. Or after 1934, the Ernst Röhm figure, uh, he was the head of the, S, the, the stormtroopers. And yeah, he, he, he's Hitler, he, he shoots himself after he's been taken into custody and, and it's been clear he's, he's gonna be shot by somebody else. Uh, yeah, so that figure's not gonna work. Uh, the picture, this is one of the last taken in the last couple of months of the war, but it's Joseph Goebbels congratulating and pinning an Iron Cross second class on a, I think he's a 15 year old boy, because by the time 1940, late 44 gets here, the Germans have formed what is called the Volkssturm of every able-bodied child or retired person, any man who's not already in uniform is going to be in, in this new unit to resist mostly the Soviets. They are minimally trained, they're minimally armed, and they're sent out because there's really nobody else left to send. Uh, a couple quick things, and I'm kind of, I'm sorry, I'm probably already exceeding my, my allotted time. There are resistors to Nazi Germany, though, even despite all this, uh, mostly groups of teenagers. Uh, there's a group that operates kind of in, in northwestern Germany. They call themselves the Edelweiss Pirates. Um, they smoke, they drink, they wear clothing that is not the approved wear in the Hitler Youth. Um, there are others that are called swing kids. I mean, they listen to jazz records and also smoke and drink and hang out. Uh, that are they're not they're anti sort of anti Hitler Youth people. 
the black market, despite Nazi denials, flourishes. And if there is something that you need, you can always get it, but running the risk of the, the person you're buying it from being a Gestapo informant. I'm going to tell you about the weirdest thing that I know about Nazi Germany. I don't, I can't explain it. There is a fad that happens in the 30s about people posing with people in bear suits. I'm not making this up. This is really true. The picture, this is the picture here. The woman on the left, weirdly, is, is Ava Brown's sister. So Hitler's mistress, soon to be his wife for about a day, uh, posing with the guy in the bear suit. And it's not just her. These are two soldiers. And I think it's the same bear suit. I mean, if you start, yeah, I actually, I spent probably more than my boss would allow time the other day comparing things on the bear suit to try to see if I could figure out if it's the same bear suit. Uh, bear suit at the beach. Uh, bear suit at a children's school. Uh, bear holding girl with parasol. Bear at a wedding with a top hat. Bear holding a Scotty. And I can't prove this, but weirdly, I think the Scotty is probably Ava Brown's Scotty. She had two Scotty dogs. Um, with a Hitler Youth girl. Uh, and and the, the beauty of the bear suit guy, though, is that he survived the collapse of, of, of Germany. Uh, so we have bear suit guy in Berlin with three GIs. <laughs> and, and, if, and, if, and if somebody can, can tell me, like, if you know the identity of bear suit man, let me know, because I can get a book out of that. <laughs> It'll... Uh, I think it's a, frankly a lot like something that actually our, our daughter has been involved in, which is people in T-Rex costumes doing it. If you're on the internet, you can, you can find... I, I, I can't explain it. Um, the Myers that I introduced you to, the family from Berlin, um, are part of a generation inside Germany. There are 5.5 million German soldiers killed during the course of the war. More than 2 million civilians. Um, it's, I, 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 don't, I, I don't really have a good way to, to phrase that. Uh, almost every major city and many, many minor cities are destroyed by bombing or by ground assault or artillery. And the thing with Nazi Germany is, that, and one of the reasons I've had, I've wrestled with this for, for a long time, there's a lot of evil to go around here. And some of it committed during the war in Germany and with, by the Germans and other places is, is beyond comprehension. I, 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 I don't fully understand it. But at the same time, I think it's important to realize that there are people who survived Germany, who lived there, that are just regular people like the rest of us. And I don't know if the Meyer family survived Berlin or their children did, but I kind of hope they did. Which ends my presentation. Mm -hmm. So if, if any questions, I'll be happy to see if I can stumble through an answer or two. Uh, uh, Tom, Tom, in the back. I, 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 don't, I don't know that man. I don't know why I called him Tom. He's, he, I, he's, 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 he's unknown to me. It's one of, the, one of those uh, mysteries. Uh, uh, you uh, pointed out that in this, uh, in this uh, fair and traveling arrangement, the uh, brides uh, got married with a helmet sitting next to yep. them on the, on the counter. I wondered what the uh, uh, soldiers who were doing this uh, had next to them on the counter. It's, it's the, the, the photographs I've seen of it, it's usually a field table. Mm -hmm. They put some, try to put some flowers on it. Uh, there are candles. The bride's picture is usually there. And in some case, depending on which unit is the person is from, you may have like a picture of, of Hitler kind of in the background sort of blessing the marriage. Uh, it became traditional 
after, I think, 30, 1938, that if you got married in Germany as a, as a gift to you from the state, you got a copy of Hitler's book, Mein Kampf, as your wedding present. No charge to you, just totally free, just in, you know. And I, I, I think you'd be stupid not to send a thank you note yeah. for, for that. Mm. Sir. What part, if any, did uh, religion play in the in that during that period of time? Hitler made a point of trying to get rid of it entirely. Uh, he had zero, almost zero success among the Catholic areas in Germany, mostly the South, so Bavaria, Baden-Württemberg, um, where you have large Catholic populations. To the Protestants, he 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 started the Nazi Party started something called the German Christians. So to take you out, let's say, from the Lutheran Church, but to put you in a state Nazi state-created church that was entirely controlled by, by the party, and that never really caught on either. Uh, so he, I mean, he actively was, was, couldn't figure out a solution to the religion problem, but he knew that it was a danger to the regime. It, 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 it depends. Uh, the first concentration open was Dachau in 1933. Uh, the, popula the first generation at Dachau was heavily communist. In, in most cases, they were detained. In some cases, they were detained perpetually, but in most cases, they were detained. They were thought to be re-educated, and they tried to integrate them back into society. If they lapsed or slid back into their old beliefs, the, 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 the penalty was much greater. So I mean, they, they didn't just, they, the communists, is, they weren't just sort of clear cut, we didn't just, just kill all of them. Uh, many, most of the leaders were killed. But the communist rank and file in Germany, which is, is in their millions, uh, they, they, they didn't do that. Uh, Nazi Germany or the communists? The, the, basically, it was an electoral failure. Uh, communists, again, I think were the third largest party in Germany, like going into the, 19, the th 1932 elections. They just couldn't quite get the majority over the Nazis. Uh, and Germany is a parliamentary government system, which means, like, when Hitler took power, it wasn't his pa he didn't have enough strength just to, just to make it totally Nazi. It's, it's a parliamentary government, so he had to pick people from other minor parties to sort of cobble together the majority in, in the German Reichstag. And the communists just, they never quite got there, but like through most of the 20, for certainly from the latter 25 forward, it was up in the air who was going to be the, the new leading party in Germany. It was going to be communist, it was going to be Nazi, or if it was going to be the Social Democratic Party. Yes, ma'am. Not a question, but just a comment. Sure. I was in Leipzig last uh, October for the uh, uh, anniversary of the Leip Leipfest, and I went to an antique store, and I saw a case with several iron crosses. There was an iron cross, it was 95 euros, and then there was a mother's cross, and I think that was around 35 or 40 euros. There was a, um, a what, what do they call it, a, a hero's cross, or a, a, another cross that was around 45, 50 euros but several crosses, but the swastika was, was marked out. You, they, the owner of the antique store said he couldn't allow the swastika to be seen, and that's where he had the price tag. I, I tell you the weird, weird thing about that is, is since the war, Germany has been more serious about fighting Nazism than almost anybody else. It's illegal in Germany today to deny the Holocaust. It's a criminal offense. Well, and it, and it is, and it's like, for example, even if you, you served in the, the, the new German army that's created in 1949, um, even if you had a decoration that was from the Second World War, it, it, you could continue, most, in most cases, to wear it, but there could there absolutely no swastika on it whatsoever. They all had to be, they all had to be denazified. Well, in, in maybe we'll have another talk another day, but like just in terms of like post-war, the thing I do like for my day job in terms of research is, is war crimes. 
and it's a fascinating subject to, to, to if you walk through it to see how Germany, Britain, America, Russia, and some other countries viewed Nazi crimes after the war was, was over. Um, periodically, you know, Germany's got some, 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 some lapses to it, but I mean, they, 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 there was in many cases a serious look at trying to, trying to get rid of that. Would still have it would still have the imperial eagle or still not the imperial but the the crown would be on it. Yes, ma'am. <laughs> you, you probably made a good buy. <laughs> Sir. Did they have bomb shelters in in these oh, yeah. major cities and that sort of I, thing I, in I, Germany? I tell you, we we went to a weird. They certainly did, um, <laughs> and. Factories had their own. So, for example, if you worked at, 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 at E.G. Farben or you worked at Essen uh, Steel Plant, you had one that's totally was calculated to be of the size sufficient for the for that workforce. Uh, we toured one a couple of years ago that looks like a it looks like a missile silo. I mean, I think it must be like six or seven stories tall, but it's round with like a conical top on it, and they're they have their own filtration system. They had their own, like it was. It had a rubber gasket to seal it against a gas attack. Uh, but and they started building those in in sort of like 36, 37. So they had a good, they had a good three years worth of worth of preparation in terms of before the war. Yes, sir. I have my, when I do the war crimes class, I have my students read Ordinary Men, Christopher Browning's book. I, I, my experience is that he has the right argument. And I, I like especially that he, he makes it about, it's not just a Germany problem that if you do, like you look at the Milgram experiments and some other things, that it's kind of a human being problem. This happened to be in Germany. But the scary part about that and about this, this, this uh, reserve police battalion he writes about these murders, mass murders, are committed by people that would never have had a criminal record and would never have one again after the war. I Mark, mean, can, you give ordinary can you give everybody just a three-sentence synopsis of the book? I'm sorry. Uh, Christopher, Bra he's, he's, uh, Christopher Browning is a British author, and he's looking at a reserve police battalion, German police battalion, that's operating in the Eastern Front the only mission of this unit and others like it is, is to murder Jews. It serves no other function. It goes to an area, they round up, they murder, they move on. And he goes as far as in depth as the record will allow in terms of looking at the way the unit is put together and who the people are, and they're nobody. They're not people you would pick as murderers because they never had been and they never would be again. But there's something that gets switched in them that allows them to continue to, to murder tens of thousands of people. And one of the, que the provocative questions he asks in there is how, how could that be? And there's a couple different you know, answers to that. I mean, Browning's book, I mean, there are others that say that it's something essentially German that's only, only the German culture and history and experience have made people capable of doing that. And Browning's argument is that, no, nah, not really. It, it's happened other places, and it probably will happen other places, but there, it's, it's a fascinating, it's, a, it's, an easy, it's an easy read, but it's a very provocative book that makes you think about things. So head to your local bookstore or Amazon and buy a copy and tell Chris I said hi. Thank you for your very kind attention.